All right, folks, welcome to 2018 Advanced Higher Multiple Choice Answers, or some sort of explanation of the answers in my vague and rambling style. Uh, once again, I have not cheated. I do have the proper answers here. I haven't looked them up in advance. So you get to, me, you get to see me make mistakes. But hopefully that will enable us to get a little insight into uh, the mindset of answering these questions. Stop rambling, start working here. Which of the following is not a form of electromagnetic radiation? Interesting question. It sort of harks back to the National Five. And the answer is A. It's beta particles. That's an unusual question to start with. Number two. The diagram represents the periodic table. This, uh, basically, that's just no at time. It's the F block. The reason being that the first two columns are filling the S orbitals, S1 and S2. These six columns here are filling the P orbitals. That's why there's six of them, of course, because you can put six electrons. And these 10 columns are filling the Ds, so we're left with the Fs for these. That's why there's 14. Quick reminder, F orbitals are when L equals 3 and M equals negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, um, and up to positive 3. That's why there's 7 orbitals. Each one can hold 2 electrons, so that's why there's 14. I could shamelessly plug my videos on atomic orbitals, but I'm not going to. You've probably seen them already. Representation of a d orbital. Uh, the maximum number of electrons... Oh, sort of trick question. They're just checking uh, any orbital. It says this orbital, but any orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons. That's the definition of an orbital. Are we still on the camera? Yes, we are. For the reaction... Uh, BF3, the three-dimensional arrangement of the bonds around the boron atom changes. This is VSEPR theory. Uh, right, so no shortcut for this. We're just going to have to work it out. B uh, is in group three, so it has got three outer electrons plus another three is six pairs in total. Uh, over two, Sorry, six electrons in total over two mm. is there are three pairs and all of them are involved in bonding because there's three Fs which means you're talking about a trigonal planar arrangement in the plane of the page with 120 degrees. Does that help us? Sort of. Narrows it down to these. BF4 minus still three outer electrons. Uh, now you've attached four things to it and you've got an extra charge, a negative charge, so we need to add another one on. That's eight pairs of electrons, only, f sorry, four pairs of electrons. And all four of them, in fact, are involved in bonding because there's four Fs. So that is a tetrahedral, which means the answer is D. Number five. Can't really, can we fit this on? Yeah, sort of. Let's have a look. Which of the following correctly shows the arrangement of 3D electrons in a nickel 2 plus ion in this? Well, nickel is or was nickel zero, no charge was 4s2, let me count along, 3d1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It was 3d8. Because it's nickel 2+, plus, we've lost these two entirely. Remember, you lose them before that. So we've got 8d electrons. Does that help us? Yeah, we can chuck that away. Scratch that one. Um, 2, 4, 6, 8, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Scratch that one as well. Two, four, six, eight. Hmm. Would they all be degenerate or would they be split? Of course, the water, the presence of the ligands causes the splitting. That's how you know the answer is B. If it was just isolated nickel atoms in space, in a vacuum, that's the answer. But this is because the electrons have been split by the ligands. The D-electrons have been split by the ligands. Number six, manganese has an oxidation number five in... Oh, I hate these donkey work questions. The only shortcut that I know is that I remember that manganese is seven in permanganate, so I'm going to start with this one and work backwards. X is the charge of manganese. Oxygen is two, negative two. That total comes to zero, so that's not going to be it. Um... X plus uh, four lots of negative two comes to negative three. That becomes negative eight, becomes plus eight. Oh, that looks like the answer there. There we go. I get, if it was my exam, I'd go back and just double check the other ones. Number seven. 
you've got an equilibrium. Which line on the table is correct if the temperature of the equilibrium mixture is increased? Right. The delta H is for the left to right reaction and it is exothermic, which means if you crank up the temperature, this equilibrium is going to go to the left because that's the endothermic direction, which means the K number is going to decrease because you're going to drop the right-hand side concentration and increase the left-hand side concentration, uh, which means K will decrease. Concentration of SO3 as temperature increases. It's just going to be decrease as well. So I'm tempted to go with A. Simple as that. That's that's a weird second column. I can understand that one. That's an unusual second column. Um, number eight. Which line of the color table correctly describes H2CO3 and HCN in the above equation? Okay. H2CO3 is here, and it's reacting with cyanide to form HCN and HCO3. Hmm. It would be... Okay, it might be easier to actually go the other way around to have a look at the HCN. If you're going backwards, that's what the conjugate means. So as you travel from right to left, the HCN is kicking off a hydrogen ion which means it's acting as a conjugate acid. And the only question is, what is the H2CO3 doing? It's donating a hydrogen, in fact, to the HCN. So it's actually acting as an acid, which is a horrible one because you see the CO3, you tend to assume that's a base, but it's actually H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. So that makes perfect sense. So we're on D. Number nine. What is the concentration, it might be calculator time, of hydroxide ions uh, in a solution with a pH of 8.5? Right. Oh, concentration of hydroxide ions. Oops, nearly, nearly fell into the trap there. Ha ha. Uh, cool. So, uh, concentration of hydroxide times concentration of hydrogen is equal to the water constant, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. This... Uh, we apparently don't know, but we can work it out because pH is negative log to the base 10 of the concentration of the hydrogen ions. So what we do is we take... Now, <laughs> this is not my usual calculator, so I may be having problems with this one. We take 8.5, we make it negative, and then we do shift log of it. Ah, this is a modern calculator, and because I'm a dinosaur, we need to do it the other way around. So it's shift log of negative gives us ah, oh, this calculator stuck in <laughs> decimal place mode <laughs> 3 times 10 to the negative <clears throat> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 oh jeez, too early in the morning don't have my specs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 could you be any older here? <clears throat> 3 times 10 to the negative 9. <clears throat> All we need to do is solve for OH. <clears throat> Excuse me. Coughing there. Coughing in the microphone. <clears throat> so calculating that, we're left with um, 3 to the power of negative 6, which is B. I'm assuming this is right. Uh, I need to free my calculator up. RTFM, read the flipping manual. Number 10. Butanoic acid is a weak acid which dissociates as shown. The equilibrium can be shifted to the right. This is also a sort of higher question. Uh, catalyst, nope. Catalysts don't change the equilibrium position. Sulfuric acid would add hydrogen or hydronium ions, so that would drive it to the left. That's wrong. Sodium hydroxide doesn't appear to be involved in this. Sodium butanoate would release butanoate ions, which again would drive it to the left. This one here is the only one that will drive it to the right because you will kidnap these due to the hydroxide ions and you will drive the equilibrium to the right. It's a higher question, interestingly, basically. Number 11, which of the following salts forms an alkaline solution in water? If it's an alkaline solution, you need to have made it, it being the salt, from a weak base 
and a strong acid. No, 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 no. Stop thinking ahead, hey. A weak acid and a strong base. Try and get it right. So that's made from sulfuric acid, so that's nope. That's made from strong and strong, so that's a nope. Ammonium nitrate, that's a weak base and a strong acid. It looks right. Potassium propanoate, yeah, that's strong base, uh, weak acid. So the answer is C. Number 12, which of the following combination would produce a buffer solution? A buffer solution is a weak acid or a weak base and a salt of that weak base put together. So... Uh, no, that's not an, an ammonium salt. Ammonium chloride uh, and ammonia. That sounds promising. Sodium chloride and no, that's a strong. Uh, and that's strong as well. This seems relatively straightforward so far. Ha, famous last words. For which following reactions with the value of... Uh, yeah, this. The wording here is the key to making this question difficult. For which of the following reactions would the value of delta G minus delta H be closest to zero? Apparently an impossible question. Until you ever think about what this would actually be. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So if you rearrange this to get that expression there, you find T delta S equals delta G minus delta H. So they're looking for which reaction here would have this value here closest to zero. In other words, the delta S. They're looking for the smallest delta S. So the smallest change in entropy. Now if we start to analyze these for a second, you find you've got a solid going to a solid and a gas. That is going to cause a large jump in entropy. Solid and a gas going to two gases. Again, a large jump in entropy because you're losing the solid, which is more organized, of course. That's why the gas is such a high entropy. Gases are all over the place. That's my mime for gases at this time of the morning. Solid and aqueous, aqueous and gas. Again, you're producing a gas, so I'm going to know to that. I hope it's this one, otherwise I'm going to look like a total muppet. Aqueous and solid, aqueous and solid. Right. That's your answer there. Simple once you understand what they're asking for. They couldn't just ask, of course, which of the following would represent the smallest change in entropy. That would be too easy. Number 14. The following reaction is first order with respect to P, second order with respect to Q. Which of the following is not correct? The reaction is third order overall. That's totally fine, so that's not an answer. The reaction occurs by a simple one-step mechanism. Definitely not, because... How do I know that? because there's only one P and one Q here, and yet second order with respect to Q means that there are two Qs in the rate determining step. And that's not what we're seeing here, so it can't be a single step. The rate of the reaction decreases as the reaction proceeds. That, I'm going to say, is true for all reactions, so I'm hoping it's the last one again. The rate of the reaction will double if the initial concentration of P is doubled. Yeah. First order with respect to P, so multiply it by multiply concentration of P by 2, and the rate will double as well. Number 15. Which of the following types of hybridization occur in the above compound? Well, these bonds here are sp3. These bonds here are sp. But there's no double bonds, which means there's no sp2s. So I'm going to go with B. Number 16, uh, organic territory. This is notoriously where I make my mistakes because I haven't taught it for a year. Um, that's my excuse up front. That's my racing driver excuse. Benzofuran is an important starting material. The gram formula mass of benzofuran. In other words, what is the formula? <laughs> I screwed this up last time, so I'm going to take double last year papers. So I'm going to double attention not to do this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hydrogens, one, two, three, four. Uh, none on there. One, two, three. F five, so, uh, hydrogens, sorry, I'm losing track of my hydrogens here. Let's do the other one. Let's do the tricky ones first. One, two, three bonds. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to say H6, O1. 
Let me calculate that. I'm going to say 118, and we'll see at the end if I'm right. 17. The diagram represents one enantiomer of an opt optically active compound where W, X, Y, Z are four different groups. Jolly good. Which the following represents the other enantiomer? Well, it's obviously not that one, because that's the same. We want the same orientation space, but two of the groups to be swapped. Y and Z are still next to each other. Oh, are they? Oh, that's a tough one. That's a tough one, interestingly. W and Y. I did say just two of the groups to be swapped. What's this one here done? This would be a hell of a lot easier if you could build them, of course. So, X and Z. What has been swapped here? I'm tempted to come back to this one at the end. It's me chickening out. <laughs> I'll come back to that one at the end. Let me chew over that with my subconscious. 23. Salbutamol is used to treat asthma. Now, if it behaves like one of the body's chemicals, then it is an agonist. Number 24. 200 mils of water is added to 50 mils of 2 molar sodium hydroxide. The concentration of the diluted solution is. So that means our final volume is 250. We started with 50, so that's a 5, sorry about that. So uh, that is a 5 times dilution. Um, so I'm going to go with 0 0.4, because we've taken our original concentration and divided by 5, which is 2 fifths, which is 0 0.4. Number 25, for solvent extraction from an aqueous solution, the solvent used should be immiscible with water and relatively unreactive. Which of the following would be the most suitable solvent? Relatively unreactive. Well, I'm seeing two that are not reactive here. I'm seeing an ether. And, I'm, and that's, well, actually, that's the most unreactive one. Because that can be oxidized to a carboxylic acid. That can be oxidized. What can you do with carboxylic acids? Well, they can neutralize. So, yeah, I'm going to go with this one. It's definitely been the least reactive. Ethers are chemically very unreactive. Also, uh, larger ethers like this one, two, three, four, five carbons. Yeah, that will be immiscible with water. So I'm going to go with B. Which the following is not a step in recrystallization? Uh, yep. Uh, filter, yep. And dissolve the crystals, yep. And that one. That's gravimetric. That's uh, precipitation. Uh, <laughs> the enantiomer question is still bugging me in my subconscious. I'll come back to it. I will come back to it. 21. Simplified mass spectrum of an organic compound is blown and blow. Mass spectrum. Which the following could not have produced this spectrum? Well, I would go straight to that one and say that's the GFM. Does that help us any? GFMs. I'm going to pause the video and just calculate the GFMs here. It's donkey work. There's no point in watching me do it. Talk about being stupid. I was actually making work for myself there. Um, it's I forgot to read the knot. Um, these are all 74. That's 73. I assume my calculations are correct. I'm going to go with C. Um, 22. Infrared spectrum would not be predicted to have an absorption in the wave number range. Let me go and get a date book, please. Okay, again, don't forget the knot here, hey? Not predicted to have an absorption in the wave number range. Well, 3,100 to 3,000 is the benzene ring. So that is correct, so it's not the answer, if you know what I mean. Sorry, get it on camera, hey? 2962 to 2853, that's the alkane stretch. <clears throat> the alkane CH stretch, yeah, so... I'm going to go with that not being the answer because it's got one. The same re reason it's got a benzene ring. 1730 to 
1717, very specific. That's an aromatic ester, which again, this is an example of, so that's the ester group there. I'm hoping it's this one. <clears throat> 1150 to 1070, that's for an ether, but specifically an alkyl ether. What a nasty question. Oh, no, 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 sorry. That's not a blooming ester group, you silly old fool. So it does, it is an ether because that's the ether content. That's not an ether. That's, sorry, that is not an ester. It's an ether group. So the answer is C. Ah, yeah, I screwed that one up. Hence the advantage of checking all the answers. That is the advantage of checking that the, all the other answers are wrong, guys. You do help to catch your own mistakes. Grand. Okay, so what's, we're getting there. Uh, we're running out of time here at Melbourne Academy. Number 18. The most appropriate reactants for... Does that say this was an easy paper letter? The most appropriate reactants for the synthesis of this. That is an alkoxide, which you make from reacting an alcohol with a group 1 metal. So basically, it's A. There's no other ones that can be there. 19. This is an example of, you just have to know it, basically. This is your nitrile molecule, and this is a carboxylic acid, and it's basically just hydrolysis. It's just one of these annoying parts of synthesis where you just have to remember it. It's C. We're not even going to go into why it is that. Empirical formula. Oh, how I love these. Um, 16 grams of copper. So you take the mass of each element, put it over its GFM, and then simplify everything to try and get sensible numbers. 64 point something is copper? 63.5. And therefore oxygen must be 2. So that's your copper. This is your oxygen, 2 over 16. These numbers are going to be horrendous. I can smell that just by looking at them. Yeah. Oh no, 0.25. So that's a quarter more or less. And 2 over 16, I should be able to do this in my head. That's an eighth. Of course, it is 0 0.125. Divide them both by the smallest number. That goes to 1. And that goes to 2. Of course it does. So the answer is B. <clears throat> 27. Melting point of an impure substance was determined to be that. After purification, ah, the melting point should always be higher. Because impure substances always have a lower melting point and it should be a narrower range. So the answer is B. 28. During the technique of heating to constant mass. Lots of practical questions here, eh? The purpose of the desiccator that is to stop water getting reabsorbed, basically, is the... That's C. 29. While it's cooling, that is. Go and watch my video on practical techniques if you haven't already done this in the classroom. 29. Using TLC... RF values, which the following would affect the RF values for an individual component. It would not be that, because the RF value is the ratio that a particular dot has travelled compared to the solvent. So it's that ratio there, this to this. And if this moved further, this would just stretch up as well. Concentration of the sample? Nope. That just affects how dark or light that spot is. The length of the TLC plate, for the same reason as A is wrong, C is also wrong. That, on the other hand, that will vary the distance that it moves in the particular solvent. And number 30, which of the following diagrams shows the apparatus is correctly set up for heating under reflux? Reflux is a vertical condenser, so these two are both wrong. Now, this is an interesting one. I have a slight argument with the SQA here. They will tell you the answer is C. So I'm not going to go into why counter current flow is more efficient in condensers. But then again, they could come back and argue that for a simple condenser, like a Liebig condenser like this, counter current flow is not important. So I would love to argue that point, but I'm not going to. Uh, answer time. Wait, 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 before we do the answers. Before we do the answers. Where was the question that was killing me? There we go. So, oh, 
Oh, ha <laughs> ha. This shows the clarity of going back later on and trying a different approach. What I said in words, I believe I said in words, was to take any two of these and swap them around but keep the configuration. That is that one, you daft old fool. So that is A. Right, let's see how many mistakes I have made. I will pause the video there. I'll say bye-bye and thank you for listening. Um, if there is any more to this video, then you will know that I managed to make one or more mistakes. Thanks for listening, folks. Mistake the first. Fascinating. I write the right thing here. This is correct. And then I go with the wrong answer. Uh, I even skimmed over this one. Uh, that is a strong base and a weak acid, which is exactly what I wrote here. That's just not paying attention, is it, hey? Let's see if there's any more. Ha ha ha! Mistake the second. <sighs> which of the following statements is not correct? This shows you how easy it is to get wrapped up in the logic of the question and not answering what they're looking for. I was looking for the incorrect statement. That statement there is incorrect. I even said that. But I got so wrapped up in determining which statements were true or false that I missed the answers. Always worth a check, guys. Two down. Let's see if there's any more. <laughs>